This is a four wave bridge rectifier. It's used to power electronic circuits. So we're going to learn in detail how they work in this video. Electricity is dangerous and can be fatal. You must be qualified and competent to carry out any electrical work. Full bridge rectifiers look like this. There are many shapes and sizes, but they essentially consist of four diodes in a certain arrangement. They are usually aligned in a diamond configuration, but they can be aligned in other ways such as these. We typically find them represented on engineering drawings like this, this being the symbol for a diode. The arrow points in the direction of conventional current. This shows that AC electricity is the input and DC electricity is the output. The full bridge rectifier converts AC alternating current into DC direct current. Why is that important? because the power outlets in our homes provide AC, but our electrical devices use DC. So we need to convert the AC into DC electricity. For example, a laptop charger takes AC from the power outlet and converts this to DC to power the laptop. If you look at the power adapter for your laptop and other electronic devices, the manufacturer's label tells you it's converting AC to DC. In this example, it states that it needs an input of between 100 and 240 volts with the symbol for AC electricity, and this will draw 1.5 amps of current. It will then output 19.5 volts of DC electricity and 3.33 amps of current. Notice that it also states 50 to 60 hertz. This is the AC frequency, and we'll look at that in just a moment. In AC electricity, the voltage and current constantly change direction between forwards and backwards. That's because there's a magnetic field in the AC generator, which essentially pushes and pulls electrons in the wires. This is therefore changing between positive and negative values as it flows forwards and backwards. The voltage is not constant, even though the multimeter will make it look like it is. If we plotted this, we get a sine wave pattern. The voltage changes between a peak positive and a peak negative value as the maximum intensity of the magnetic field passes the coils of wire inside the AC generator. This example reaches 170 volts at its peaks. So if we plotted these values, we have positive and negative peaks of 170 volts. If we took the average of these values, we would get zero volts. That's not very useful, so a clever engineer decided to use the root mean squared voltage. That is what our multimeters calculate when we connect them to the electrical outlets. To find the peak voltage, we multiply the root mean squared voltage by the square root of 2 which is roughly 1.41. To find the RMS voltage, we divide the peak voltage by 0 0.707. For example, here I have a North American, British, Australian, and European power outlets. This multimeter shows basic waveforms, and when I connect to any of these between the phase and neutral, we see a sine wave, which is indicating this is AC electricity. Notice that the British and European outlets are 230 volts. The Australian outlet is 240 volts, but all three of these are at a frequency of 50 hertz. However, the North American outlets read 120 volts at a frequency of 60 hertz. The frequency is measured in hertz, but this just means the sine wave is repeating 60 times per second in the North American electrical systems and 50 times per second in the rest of the world. The voltage is lower in the North American system at 120 volts, whereas it's 230 to 240 volts in the rest of the world. Although there are some exceptions, but we won't go into that in this video. The peak voltage of each electrical system is therefore as follows. In DC electricity, the voltage is constant and in the positive region. The electrons do not reverse, 
they all flow in just one direction. So if I measure this battery, we see a flat line in the positive region at around 1.5 volts. So this is DC electricity. This solar panel also produces DC. We can see it produces a flat line at around 4 volts on the multimeter. We can use this adapter to measure a USB port. We can see it's providing around 5 volts DC. And if we plot this with the other multimeter, we again see a constant flat line indicating this is DC electricity. This is a four wave bridge rectifier. On these input terminals, we see around 12 volts AC with a sine wave. And on these output terminals, we see around 14 volts of DC. So this device is converting AC to DC. The voltage is slightly higher on the output because of the capacitor. And we'll see why that is later on in this video. Now, you need to remember that rectifiers will only convert AC to DC. It cannot convert DC into AC. For that, we would need an inverter, which uses special electronic components to achieve that, but we won't cover that in this video. By the way, we have covered how power inverters work in detail in our previous video. Links can be found in the video description down below for that. The rectifier consists of diodes. A diode is a semiconductor device which allows current to flow through it, but in only one direction. So if we connect this lamp to a DC power supply, it will illuminate. We can reverse the leads and it will still illuminate. If I place a diode on the red wire and connect this to the positive, it will again illuminate. But now when I reverse the leads, the diode blocks the current and the lamp remains off. So it only allows current to flow in one direction. And we can therefore use this to control the direction of current in a circuit to form DC electricity. Let's see some different ways of how that's achieved. If we looked at an AC supply with a step down transformer, which simply reduces the voltage to a safer level, the electrons are flowing forwards and backwards. So the load experiences an AC sine wave. The load could be anything from a resistor, a lamp, a motor, etc. If we inserted a diode, the diode will only allow current to flow in one direction. So the load now experiences a pulsating waveform. The negative half of the sine wave is currently being blocked. We can reverse the diode to block the positive half and only allow the negative half. This is therefore a half wave rectifier. The output is technically DC because the electrons only flow in one direction. It's just not a very good DC output as it's not completely flat. Here I have a resistor which is connected to a low voltage AC supply. We see on the oscilloscope the AC sine wave. When I connect a diode in series with this, the oscilloscope shows a pulsating pattern in the positive region. If I reverse the diode, the oscilloscope shows a pulsating pattern in the negative region. If I connect two lamps in parallel, one with a diode, we see that the one without the diode is brighter because it's using the full waveform. The other lamp is dimmer because it's only using half of this waveform. The diode is blocking the other half. If we view this in slow motion, we can see that the diode connected lamp is flickering more because of the gaps in power. Therefore, we can use this for simple circuits such as lighting or perhaps charging some simple batteries, but we can't use this for electronics as the components need constant power, otherwise they will not work correctly. We can add a capacitor in parallel with the load to improve the output. We'll look at that later on in this video. A better improvement is to use a full wave rectifier, and there are two main ways to do that. We can create a full wave rectifier simply by using a center tap transformer and two diodes. A center tap transformer just has another wire on the secondary side, 
which is connected to the center of the transformer coil. This allows us to use the full length of the transformer coil or just half of it. Because the current constantly reverses in AC electricity, while in the positive or forward half, the current flows through diode one and into the load, and then back to the transformer via the center tapped wire. Diode two is blocking the current, so it can't return through here. Only half the transformer coil is therefore being used. In the reverse or negative half, the current flows through diode two, through the load, and then back to the transformer. Diode one is blocking the current. The current flows in one direction through the load. In either case, the current flows in just one direction through the load. So it is considered DC. But it is not smooth, it is still pulsating, there are just no gaps. The negative half has been converted into a positive half. The waveform is not smooth, so we need to apply some filtering, such as a capacitor. Again, we'll look in detail at that later on in this video. The most common method used is the full wave bridge rectifier. This uses four diodes. The AC supply is connected between diodes one and two, with the neutral between three and four. The DC positive output is connected between diodes two and three, and the negative between diodes one and four. In the positive half of the sine wave, the current flows through diode two, through the load, through diode four, and then back to the transformer. In the negative half, the current flows through diode three, through the load, through diode one, and then back to the transformer. So the transformer is supplying an AC sine wave, but the load is experiencing a rippled DC waveform because the current flows in just one direction. In this example circuit, we can see that rectified waveform on the oscilloscope, but this is not a flat DC output. So we need to improve this by adding some filtering. Using a rectifier will result in a ripple in the waveform. To smooth this out, we need to add some filters. The basic method is to simply add an electrolytic capacitor in parallel to the load. The capacitor charges during the increase in voltage and stores the electrons. It then releases these during the decrease. This therefore reduces the ripple. The oscilloscope will show the peaks of each pulse, but now the voltage doesn't decrease to zero. It slowly declines until the pulse charges the capacitor again. We can further reduce this by using a larger capacitor or by using multiple capacitors. In this simple example, you can see the LED turns off as soon as the power is interrupted. But if I place a capacitor in parallel with the LED, it remains on because now the capacitor is discharging and powering the LED during the interruptions. In this circuit, I have a lamp connected as the load. The oscilloscope shows the rippled waveform. When I add a small 10 microfarad capacitor, we see that it makes very little difference to the waveform. When I use a 100 microfarad capacitor, we see the dip is no longer down to zero volts. At 1000 microfarads, the ripple is very small. At 2200 microfarads, it's nearly completely smooth. This would be fine to use for many electronic circuits. We could use multiple capacitors also. Here we have a 470 microfarad capacitor, which has made some difference. But if I use two capacitors in parallel, we see the waveform is much more improved. When using a capacitor, we need to place a bleeder resistor across the output. This is a high value resistor, which will drain the capacitor when the circuit is off to keep us safe. Notice with this circuit that when I switch it on, the capacitor charges quickly to over 15 volts. But when I switch it off, the DC output is still at 15 volts because there is no load. So the energy is still stored in the capacitor. This could be very dangerous if the voltage is high. 
In this example, I place a 4.7 kilo ohm resistor across the output. We see the capacitor charges up to 15 volts, and when I switch it off, the capacitor quickly discharges. The electrons are flowing through the resistor, which discharges the capacitor. We can also see that without a capacitor, the output voltage is lower than the input voltage because of the voltage drop of the diodes. Here we have a simple four wave bridge rectifier. On the input, we see there is 12 volts AC. On the output, we have 10.5 volts of DC. The voltage on the output is lower because of the diodes. Each diode has a voltage drop of around 0.7 volts. If we look at this circuit with a diode and an LED, we can measure across the diode to see a voltage drop of around 0.7 volts. The current in our full bridge rectifier must pass through two diodes on the positive half and two diodes on the negative half. So the voltage drop combines and is around 1.4 to 1.5 volts. So that is why the output will be reduced. However, if we were to connect a capacitor across the output, we will see that the output voltage is now higher than the input voltage. How is that possible? That's because the AC input is measuring the RMS voltage, or the root mean squared. This is not the peak voltage. The peak voltage is 1.41 times higher than the RMS voltage. The capacitors are charged up to the peak voltage and then release. There will be a small voltage drop because of the diodes, so the output is less than the peak input, but it will still be higher than the RMS input. For example, if we had 12 volts RMS on the input, the peak voltage would be 12 volts multiplied by 1.41, which is 16.9 volts. There will be a 0.7 volt drop here and here, so 16.9 volts subtract 1.4 is 15.5 volts. The capacitors are charged up to this voltage. This is only the approximate answer though. The amount of ripple and the actual voltage drop of the diodes will cause it to be slightly different in reality. But we can see that the output is higher than the input. Another common filter is placing two capacitors in parallel with a series inductor between these. This is used for circuits with larger loads. The first capacitor smooths the ripple. The inductor opposes the change in current and tries to keep it constant. And the second capacitor, which is much smaller, will then smooth out the final remaining ripple. Additionally, we can also connect a voltage regulator to the output. This is very common and allows some variation to the input, but it will provide a constant output voltage. This again has capacitors on either side of the regulator to ensure a smooth DC output. Here we can see a real version, which is connected to a 12 volt AC supply, and we see it has an output of around 5 volts DC. You can learn how to build your own voltage regulator in our previous tutorials. Links for this in the video description down below. Check out one of the videos on screen now to continue learning about electrical and electronics engineering as this is the end of this video. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, and of course, theengineeringmindset.com.